Okay, so welcome today. Um, you have made it to uh, the meeting of the California Farm Demonstration Network. So you can see that we have six organizations who sponsor this project and they're listed across the top of your screen. The University of California Ag and Natural Resources Division, UC Davis, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, the California Farm Bureau Federation, and the California Department of Food and Agriculture, who is um, sponsoring this session today. So I myself am with the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, and we're hosting this as a meeting of the California Farm Demonstration Network. And in a few minutes, I'm going to be introducing our um, speaker for today, Dr. Jennifer Moore, but I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to introduce you to um, what the CFDN is. Give me just a moment to admit some additional attendees. Thank you. The objective of the CFDN is to showcase the implementation of conservation practices and systems that can provide a pathway for adoption by both new and experienced farmers and ranchers. So it will also provide practical learning opportunities while at the same time fostering the formation of local connections. We really um, are designing this around a hubs idea in, in regions and the idea is to scale the adoption of conservation practices around the state. Oops. You um, are attending the fourth in a series of four presentations by the CFDN. In March, Eric Brennan presented on um, what happens to soil when you add compost and cover crop. Brent Holtz presented on whole orchard recycling. Jessica Chiardis presented on how to take a great soil sample. And today we're gonna to be hearing um, from Dr. Jennifer Moore about soil microbial dynamics in just a minute. And to find the recordings of those past meetings, you can go to the carcd.org website and find your way to current projects where, where you'll see the California Farm Demonstration Network and a link to our meeting series. Uh, you can go directly there through that QR code there. Um, and the recordings will live there for now until around the fall when we are, will be rolling out a standalone California Farm Demonstration Network website. All of you who have registered for these meetings will be, um, we will reach out to you to uh, ask if you would like to be part of an ongoing listserv to give you invitations to additional opportunities like this, as well as to regional um, farm demonstration uh, attendance opportunities. So that, I'd like to know that, I'd like you to know that at the end of the presentation, for those of you who are certified crop advisors, I'm gonna be sharing a QR code that will let you register directly for your continuing education units. If that's not a um, application that you use, I'll invite you to add your a CCA number in the chat with your name and I will go ahead and um, send those in in the old fashioned style to, to the uh, certified crop advisors so you can get your units. All right. The way we're going to structure the presentation today is in just a moment, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Moore to share her screen and she's gonna give um, a shortish presentation and um, once that, that is over, my colleague and partner in crime in this series, Dr. Karen Lowell, who's an agronomist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in the Salinas Valley, she's going to be facilitating the, um, the discussion following the presentation. And the way that this would work best for us is if in real time during the presentation, if all of you can enter your questions into the chat, we're gonna be copying and pasting them onto a Google Doc and kind of organizing them by theme and to really get at a, like a nice flow for the, the, the discussion after the presentation. So don't wait till the end of the presentation for those questions is what I'm saying. Get those into the chat and we're gonna be closely moder monitoring that and we're gonna have a really nice um, conversation after the presentation. So, um, 
Karen, is there anything else that I missed? As Jennifer, you can be maybe getting your screen ready to share as I close mine. The only thing I would add, um, Sarah, is we've been finding a lot of times people are keen for more resources. So if there's something that you want to ask us, hey, where would I get more information about that? Please put that in the chat as well. And um, we've been working on creating follow-up documents that we will make available to anybody who's attended these webinars or otherwise. Um, Love that. Thank you so much. My colleague Mariana is on the session as well, and she's going to be capturing all those great resources that you all share, as well as uh, yeah, any, any of the sharing of great resources. We're going to capture that and make sure that those are available after the presentation as well. All right. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Moore with the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Corvallis, Oregon, speaking on soil microbial dynamics today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell, tell the audience a little bit more about your, your background and then jump on into your presentation. Thank you so much for being here today. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Karen, um, for the invitation to speak today. I'm honored to be part of the excellent presenters on the, the panel and, and the amazing uh, presentations that have already occurred to date. So thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, my name is Jen Moore. I'm a recent hire with ARS as a research soil scientist, but I'm not a recent um, soil health and, and soil scientist uh, expert in the area. Um, prior to joining ARS, I was a climate initiative director with American Farmland Trust for a couple of years and helping to build that program. And prior to that, I was with NRCS. That's where I got to know Karen and did a lot of work in soil health across the country and training as part of the West Region Soil Health Division um, team lead. And, and then prior to that, I, I spent a bunch of time in academia as an associate professor in Texas um, doing soil microbial ecology work in uh, cotton fields and integrated crop livestock systems. And, um, but my, my experience has spanned the country. I did my master's at Iowa State, my PhD at Oregon State, and have worked in ecosystems from old growth forests in the Pacific Northwest to cherry orchards, grasslands, cotton, corn, soybeans, uh, sorghum, uh, a whole bunch of different systems. So today I'm excited to talk about um, testing for soil microbial dynamics with a particular emphasis on the soil health indicators and how they relate back to a lot of the microbial and biological uh, communities. And so um, likely you're all very familiar with soil health given some of the previous speakers, um, but just to define according to NRCS that soil health is the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And then we have the four uh, soil health principles, minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover, maximize a continuous living root, and maximizing biodiversity. And so what I really want to emphasize uh, uh, over the next 30 minutes or so is how important soil biology, soil organisms from the microscopic microbes all the way up to larger uh, soil fauna are critical in providing major functions to the soil from decomposition and the formation of organic matter and carbon storage um, to enhancing plant growth, protecting plants. Um, they also form symbiotic associations with plants to facilitate nutrient uptake, um, biologic uh, population control. They detoxify pollutants. They're critical, right? They're described as the eye of the needle through which all nutrients pass. So they're very critical for nutrient transformations and providing plant available nutrients to our growing crops. And even though um, soil structure is a physical property, they're critical in helping to form st stable soil aggregates, helping to facilitate aeration, drainage, water um, flow and filtration. And that, of course, is really important for our soils to resist the erosive forces of wind and water. Um, finally, because they're so in influential on forming organic matter, um, they help to increase water filtration, water storage, and water availability. And 
they even have a particular role in helping uh, to suppress uh, weeds through different interactions through microbes, plants, and other soil fauna. So today um, we're going to emphasize again soil health testing. And there are a lot of different reasons why we want to test. Um, we really want to facilitate and expand what we have had many decades of research on fertility uh, back, you know, starting in I think probably the 1940s is when fertility trials started. And over the years, we have really great recommendations on uh, the fertility and the chemical status of our soils to help with plant growth. And we wanna kind of go beyond that in identifying the constraints beyond both deficiencies and excess from a, a, a nutrient limitation. We want to be able to target practices to alleviate these and other constraints in the soil, compaction, uh, weeds, pathogens, et cetera. We want to measure soil improvement or degradation from management so we can better design systems that can optimize function and reduce the, the level of uh, soil degrading practices and help build and rebuild soils. We want to just improve our awareness about soil health in, in addition to all that great information that we have had over the decades with plant nutrition. A lot of this information is helping to build and enable the valuation of farmland. So soils, farms that are of higher soil health status tend to be valued more. And to be able to quantify that in other ways is really important um, from that perspective. And more recently, um, different soil health practices like cover cropping has been built into um, reduction of, of risk to the farmers. And so how can we enable the assessment of farming system risk to help reward farmers for some of the practices? And Jennifer, as I mentioned in the hi, first slide, yeah. Sarah, Sarah here real quick. I just wanted to um, see if you might be able to adjust the audio again. Um, there's a little bit of a crunchy sound. Let's see if we can address Let's that for just, just a moment. Let's try to go to this microphone. So now it's on a different microphone. How do I sound? I think that sounds a lot better. I'd love a little bit of feedback from uh, folks in the audience better? and in the chat. How are we doing? So much clearer, it says. Okay. Let's stick with that. Great. Thank you so much. All right. I'm actually going to, let me, let me do one thing because I'm actually getting some feedback on my end. So let me change this. And Sarah, could you just say one more thing so I can know that I can hear you? You bet. Testing. Okay. How we All do right. It. I'm putting okay. these away. Pulling these out. Thank you so much. Of course. Let me know if there are any other issues. You bet. Okay, so lots of different reasons that we should evaluate and test for soil health. And as I emphasized in that first slide, it's really because of these interactions and the driving forces of soil biology, which is critical for imparting all of these key functions that we need for healthy functioning ecosystems. So again, the focus of today then is to test for microbial dynamics. There are lots of different ways academically, commercially, to test for different indicators of biological soil health. We can measure the numbers and kinds of soil organisms and acquire a survey, if you will. We can measure their activities. How uh, rapidly is the respiration similar to our own health? We can also measure certain enzyme activities. We also do this for human health as an indicator of different functions. In the soils, we can use targeted enzymes for nutrient cycling uh, enzymes, for example, as well as some enzymes that are uh, molecularly derived that can give us an indication of stress and how that can help plants to alleviate some of the environmental stressors. And I'll give some examples about that. And then more specific functions can be indirectly measured through a suite of tests. We can look at, and we'll go through this aggregate stability, uh, bioavailable carbon, bioavailable nitrogen, and some of these other uh, indicators that can help us uh, provide insights into how healthy our microbial and biological communities are. One of the key things that hopefully will become more clear as we uh, go down this path is the standardization is really important for interpretation. Which indicators you choose, how you sample, I think that was the last speaker uh, that, that uh, talked about that, the different protocols that laboratories use similar to fertility trials. You wanna make sure that if you're submitting a sample, 
to a particular lab for an assessment that you have the same protocols done year after year for proper interpretation. You need to provide enough information about the history of your site, the management practices that you have chosen and are changing for proper interpretation. And then also, um, this is more for, for people that are trying to develop um, thresholds and establish uh, targeted values is the language that we use to communicate about, uh, you know, when we say what crop is being grown, is it this year or was it previous year? Um, do we sample in spring or fall? Do we sample deeply or more shallowly? shallowly? And how do we collect those samples are, are really important um, to properly interpret the data. So recently, and Karen can speak more about this um, if some questions come up, but there is a recommendation um, for soil testing. And in that they provide different criteria and different um, indicators to be evaluated. So they're recommending soil organic carbon, uh, a test for aggregate stability, uh, soil respiration measurement, uh, something called active carbon, bioavailable nitrogen, and then the classical suite of pH and nutrient um, nutrients, uh, both macro and micro, that should be evaluated in, in testing for soil health. And so part of the issue is that not very many labs offer all of these tests. And you might be wondering, well, what do these different tests tell you? How can we interpret it? And can we look at some examples of how people have used these assessments um, in the past. So that's what we'll do today. And this is a list of different processes on the left. Let's see, can you can you see my, well, I don't know. Um, I think you can see, yeah, my cursor. Uh, soil structural stability and water partitioning. This is a really important function. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, aggregate stability and that formation of those uh, strong aggregates are critical for this. Another indicator sometimes measured is available water capacity. It's a little bit less common. Uh, aggregate stability is probably the more common one for that particular process. So organic matter uh, cycling is very common. This has been done for decades. Um, typically it's soil organic matter, but more recently uh, it's been recommended to look specifically at organic carbon uh, because of some of the methodology. Either test is very appropriate though and can provide a lot of information. However, organic matter and organic carbon changes slowly over time. So some of these other tests, such as active carbon by something called permanganate oxidizable carbon um, test is recommended. It, it's more responsive and it shows, and it indicates that your management practices are having the directional change that you wanna have. Others uh, such as the Haney test rely on water extractable carbon and nitrogen to evaluate that. Microbial activity, um, probably the most common one is some form of respiration. There's been CO2 uh, burst tests. Uh, there are longer incubations, two to four days, uh, that are being evaluated in the laboratories across the country. And more recently, um, in commercial labs, some of the enzyme activities that are specifically involved in nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and sulfur cycling are being uh, brought online. Bioavailable nitrogen, um, there's something called the ACE protein that's been recommended, as well as some more classical tests called uh, nitrogen mineralization. And then finally, probably the newest ones that are online are the actual um, abundance and types and diversity of microbial communities. Two, um, two approaches that are becoming more and more common are fatty acid profiling, uh, we'll talk about that, as well as molecular characterization. So a whole bunch of processes, all of these are directly related and indirectly related to the health of the soil and how your community is functioning. So we'll just start with um, a couple of, of these tests. They're, we're going to start with soil structural stability and water partitioning. It's conducted um, in some of the labs across the country by a, a Cornell aggr wet aggregate stability testing mechanism that's shown here, uh, oh, you need here, shown here on the, the left-hand picture here where they simulate a rainfall event and sprinkle it down on soil that is suspended over some sieves and then they measure the amount that's left um, on the, the sieve. And then these are just a couple of pictures of aggregates being held together in this case by 
of filaments, eiffel filaments from fungi that help to span, I, I call it like Spider-Man, right? Like from particle to particle, and they help hold those particles together physically. And then what's hidden beneath the scenes that you can't see with the naked eye, but there's also these microbial glues or sticky substances that help particles and organic matter stick together so that they resist the erosive forces of water and wind. And another physical um, 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 component of soil stability in, and aggregation are roots. And they kind of act, I describe them as a hairnet where they encapsulate and hold on to those particles. Uh, and so when we have healthy fibrous roots, the, the particles stay intact more. They're also biologically active, so they have more glues and typically the hyphal, uh, fungal hyphae help to hold those all together. So aggregate stability, again, is really important for resistance and to disintegration when hit by raindrops. Uh, again, the importance for air and water exchange. And also, because it's so intricately involved in, and related to organic matter, nutrient flow and microbial habitat, this is the home of, of the microbes where they, they like to, to hang out. And then for the next few slides, I have this example from uh, Kate Scow uh, had worked with, with us when I was with NRCS a few years ago. And these are uh, samples from the Russell Ranch and where they had different treatments. And so I, I extracted them. They're from a much larger data set. Um, we didn't independently run the statistics on them, but I provide them here just so you can see that these indicators are sensitive to management. Um, and I wanted to have a California specific example. So um, these are all set up the same. The, the solid bars are the system with no cover crop. And then the striated bars are with a cover crop. And the blue is in a corn tomato rotation. And the orange bars are in a fallow wheat rotation. And what you can see here is that wet aggregate stability in the presence of a cover crop is always higher than in uh, the absence of a cover crop in both uh, crop rotations, the corn tomato, um, as well as the fallow wheat, especially when the system was planted in wheat. Um, but one of the things and a theme that I think you um, see, especially if you replay this, or I'll try to point it out as we go along, um, this is the scoring curve from Cornell. All of these samples were uh, submitted to Cornell as part of a larger effort, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and what, what I'd like you to see is that um, the scoring curve all Western soils are on the low end. And that's primarily because they were, the scoring curves are designed and, and I know that they've been working on it. I don't have updated data, um, but they are working on recalibrating some of the scoring curves for different parts of the country. But when we got these test results back, every single one of them falls in this red or orange in almost every parameter. But what I would argue is that the score rating as they're developing more uh, samples from Western soils, which are very different from the rest of the country. What, what's important to note is the difference, the relative di difference in the practice. So as we take soil samples and we evaluate for soil health, a key um, message is that you should try to compare something um, from something else. So if you're changing management, if you have a field across the road that hasn't been managed, it's a native system, for example, um, you know, if you're tracking something over time, that's gonna give you a lot more information than if you just take a single isolated sample and try to interpret it. Um, so we can see that there are improvements in this particular uh, property, uh, but if we just looked at any single one, we would say, oh, it's not, it's not very good. Um, from, from this particular assessment. So that'll be a common theme as we uh, proceed with these. Um, so this is organic matter and organic matter influences everything. It also tends to change more slowly again. So we, didn't, we don't see the big jumps um, as we did in the aggregate stability test, but we do have a slight increase of organic matter, at least in the corn tomato rotation. Uh, when that cover crop was present as opposed to in the uh, wheat fallow. So it is responsive, um, but not as dramatic as some of the other tests. These are, um, I believe these are silty clay loams uh, and clay loam soils on the Russell Ranch. And organic matter, again, 
influences a lot of the different physical, chemical, and biological properties. So uh, water holding capacity increases substantially as we increase organic matter content, that structure, and then of course, infiltration, drainage. And because organic matter is a reservoir of nutrients, it's also important for uh, nutrient and when we have good aggregation and our soils resist erosion, that's going to have a positive impact on both water and air quality as well. One of the other things when you um, look at organic matter and rating tests along the way is that you have to consider where they're from, right? So we're in California, so there's a, a, a Mediterranean climate dry uh, through a lot, a lot portion of the year and um, these are actually pretty good, you know, organic matter contents, two, three percent, not terrible uh, for for that particular area. Um, and so, again, it's the relative change that you're most interested in, rather than you know trying to make a soil a mollisol when it's an ultasol, for example, uh, in, in Georgia. So here, if you're down in uh, a, a two percent organic matter content and you're in a Georgia ultrasol, you're doing really well. But if you're in Iowa and you're 2% and you're in an Iowa mollisol, then you're going to have concerns. So we look at the differences, we take into consideration where we are uh, before we start interpreting those data. So then looking at one of the properties and in the indicators of a more dynamic property, active carbon, this is, it provides an indication of the portion of that organic matter that's providing food and energy to soil microbes. It's often related to microbial biomass and other measures of labile carbon. So it's the, it's the, the feeding of the microbes. It also tends to change more quickly um, and more, um, more dynamically than organic matter, for example. So researchers really like this and it's uh, gaining popularity in soil health tests. Again, in our cover, Sorry, I'm over here. In our cover crop, we have higher active carbon levels compared to the non uh, uh, cover crop in the corn and tomato, and slightly higher in the wheat winter cover crop trial compared to uh, the, the non uh, cover crop system. Again, we're at about 400, so we're here. Uh, we're improving a little bit. We're getting up into orange and, and yellow. Uh, in the Cornell rating, but again, these need to be calibrated for Cornell or for California soils and Western soils in general. So my um, hypothesis is that that will be shifting over time as they improve those relationships. Carbon mineralization respiration, we see a really high response um, again in that corn tomato system in the cover crop system, and really no change then in the in the wheat fallow. It also kind of emphasizes that the fallow period, right, isn't um, providing any uh, carbon to the system. And so it is going to lag behind a little bit more. It's going to take longer for some of these uh, indicators and, uh, to be responsive to. So this is another test showing um, it's how rapidly the soils are respiring. They're basically taking organic matter, they're decomposing it, and then they're respiring or releasing CO2 during that activity. Okay, the next one then is called ACE protein, acid citrate, uh, autoclavable uh, citrate extractable protein. It's a big long name, but basically um, it was designed as a way to look at bioavailable nitrogen. So similar to the active carbon, it's a pool that's representing that labile nitrogen pool um, microbes need both carbon and nitrogen. So this is a, a test that provides an indication of the ability of the soil to provide nitrogen for the microbial community. And similar to active carbon, we do see that higher um, amount in the cover crop fields versus the non-cover crop, primarily in the corn to uh, to uh, tomato rotation. Um, let's see. Again, we're down our highest value is around three, very on the low end of the, the scoring curve. And I, again, just really emphasizing that that's why I chose not to report the ratings, but to emphasize and focus on the actual values. When we have that comparison, we're uh, given a lot more insight into how that system is responding 
uh, than if we, we don't look at those. Enzymes are really complicated and there are hundreds, thousands of them um, that are, are active in the soil at any one given time. Um, different organisms have different amounts of enzymes and, and some have specialized enzymes that can help transform nutrients into one component or, or another. So enzymes are just simply proteins that increase the rate of reaction. We have them in our bodies, in our mouths, in our guts. Um, as we digest things, we're releasing nutrients to our bodies. Uh, similarly, soil uh, microbes have enzymes that are degrading those organic substances. And in this case, I'm giving examples of them transforming organic phosphorus and nitrogen and sulfur into plant available forms. Um, and this one, this is a, a, a molecular tool uh, that's not commonly used, but it, it, it gives an indication again of an enzyme that's being responsive to management. And we see a really good response with this particular enzyme. This is one that's involved in carbon cycling. So it's sort of ubiquitous amongst all organisms and it breaks down cellulose and it releases sugars um, for the, the community. And so cellulose is the number one plant polymer uh, in the world. And so it's really critical during that decomposition process that kind of gives an overall indication of how active that biological community is overall. Really high, uh, two or three times higher um, beta-glucosidase activity in the systems with cover crop, and this time both in the corn uh, tomato rotation as well as the wheat fallow. Um, okay, I'll stop there. If there are more questions, we can come back to that. Moving on to the microbial community, um, microbial biomass, abbreviated here as MB, makes up about 5%, in general, somewhere between 1% and 5% of total organic carbon. So even though it's a tiny fraction of our organic pool, again, that community is driving all of these functions. It holds about 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre, um, as well as other significant uh, com contributions to phosphorus and sulfur, but just in uh, slightly lower levels. Microbial biomass is very sensitive to management changes. And again, this is one that's kind of very dynamic. It also responds uh, to environmental pressures. So temperature and moisture can really have an uh, impact on the microbial biomass. So a single measurement is really difficult to interpret, but we can track trends over time to provide insights to management effects on microbes. Um, and then we can also look at different microbial groups that can provide an indication of functional shifts due to management. And to do that, we're going to look at what's called fatty acids. Fatty acids are essential cellular components that help form a protective layer around cells. All cells have these fatty acids. Um, and in particular, all organisms except uh, something called archaea have what's called ester-linked fatty acid. So um, different, different fatty acid profiling techniques can be used. We just happen to use these ester-linked methodology. So um, what we do in the lab is we extract all the fatty acids and then we run them on a fancy machine called a gas chromatography system that isolates these different fatty acids and different fatty acids are representative of different kinds of microbial groups. The different groups are shown on this slide. So we can get um, total all of the fatty acids added up together gives us an indication of microbial biomass. But then we can break it out into these large taxonomic groups, gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, specialized um, gram-positives called actinobacteria, and then we can start playing with ratios. So gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive. Um, gram-negative guys, are they respond rapidly to fresh inputs. So if you just tilled, for example, or if you just had large inputs, you're adding an organic amendment, uh, you're, you're bringing in residue into the soil, they tend to go up rapidly. So they respond rapidly to fresh inputs. They tend to increase with increasing organic matter, and they're also very sensitive to water stress. Gram-positive bacteria, they're more resistant to environmental stressors, and they tend to degrade complex organic matter. So one way I kind of describe the difference between these two is like, 
the the grand positives are like they're the local residents that are in like if you're in a tourist town right they're the ones that are there all year through the extreme winter through the extreme heat of the summer they're there just plugging away in the background keeping everything going so that in the summer when the conditions get right all the restaurants open up then the grand negatives the tourists come in and really their populations can explode so we can look at different ratios of these groups that can give us an indication about carbon status as well as potentially some stress. So in general, high ratios of gram positive to gram negative tend to be common in cultivated soils with low carbon and low organic ma uh, matter inputs relative to say grasslands. So that's one thing we can do. These actinobacteria are really interesting. They degrade um, complex organic matter they aid in aggregation, and they tend to be tolerant of salt and high pH, so they can give us some indications of that. On the fungal side, um, there's a variety of different kinds. Saprophytic, these are the organisms that break down dead stuff. Um, Actomycorrhizae, or buscular mycorrhizae is the one that we're really focusing on in agric agricultural soils. These are the ones that help form um, root extensions, if you will, that kind of go out and attach to plant roots and help the root acquire nutrients. And they also help the root um, and the plant deal with stress, um, for example. Different ratios of the fungal to bacteria community can provide indications. In general, although there's exceptions to this, of course, higher values tend to be associated with greater, greater functional benefits and tend to be indicative of soils with less disturbance. And then some, um, some of these uh, uh, fatty acids can target protozoa. Um, they're a little bit less common, um, but some, some analysis do. And these protozoa are organisms that are really important in nitrogen and phosphorus mineralization, as well as population control. They love to eat bacteria, um, and so they can help keep bacteria populations in check. Okay. So here's an example. This is total um, phospholipid fatty acids, um, just a type of fatty acid uh, profiling tool. And again, similar, we have higher uh, total microbial biomass in the cover crop versus the non-cover crop. Uh, we lost the, the samples that they didn't, um, uh, there was uh, some issues with the, this particular field. So it's not zero, it's just absent um, for that one. And again, this microbial biomass is 1% to 5% of organic carbon, up to 6% organic nitrogen, and 3% organic phosphorus in um, arable soils. And then just as an example of looking at those populations, this was a study back when I was in Texas where we, can, we didn't convert. We tracked the conversion of CRP lands to cropland, um, in this case, annual cotton production. And those systems are not allowing a lot of carbon to go back into the systems. And what we found was a big shift, 61% decline of our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Those fungi are really important for um, helping to aggregate soils, helping the roots get water and nutrients in the soil. So a decline of this important functional group. And then we saw an increase again of those gram positives, the ones that are kind of jump into gear when things are um, a little bit more stressed and a little bit, um, um, you know, environmental stressors as well. So we saw an increase of those populations by about almost 40% and a decline in this uh, AMF uh, community. Um, and then just some other ratios over here uh, that, that also were uh, sensitive to that management change. I'm going to skip that one. Okay, so um, the tools that are needed to really provide and help zone in on what is a good value um, is data. A lot of samples need to be collected under a lot of conditions so that we can begin to get to the level that those fertility tests took, you know, decades to get to, but we want a shortcut. We don't want to take decades to get to that. Um, we now possess the capability, the technological advances to acquire a lot of data by forming networks across the country. So NRCS is doing a great job of that with their conservation innovation grants, where they're requiring everybody to follow these protocols so they can help build the database. ARS scientists are also contributing to this effort where they're 
pooling all the data together and trying to um, make the, these inferences to be able to provide the thresholds, improve the interpretations over time, but it takes time. So um, I just wanted to, to emphasize that. So soil health is driven by the actions of soil microbes and biota. Sampling and methodological advances should focus on this living component because of everything that we just talked about. Uh, we need these appropriate databases with the historical and the management information to make proper interpretations. Um, we're proposing that a National Living Soil Archive would be an excellent um, addition, and they are working on trying to establish that. And this is a, a nice paper about the need for that that you can reference. And then we need online public forum discussion groups so we can shortcut the learning process. Um, to get us there quicker. And then I just I have a couple more slides. I, I did want to point out that the ARS Soil Bio Biology and Soil Health Team, they're building a brand new website. Um, I'm about a, a month or two in with ARS. So, um, you know, we're, we're building this, we're, we're providing different levels. So I encourage you to, to look at this website um, and check us out uh, and look uh, to what is going on within the ARS world. And this will be added to over time. It's it's pretty new. Um, and then, you know, I always get questions about biological amendments. And uh, so I have this one slide. These are just, there are so many products out there in, in the world. This is just a random snapshot of, of different products. I think I Google searched it and just took some uh, images. They have great promise and great potential. Um, but the devil is in the details with some of these products. Their success is dependent upon how they're delivered to the system, the type of soil you have, the environmental conditions when you add them, if they're compatible or not with the plants that are being grown. And the biological community is competitively fierce. And so how do these products um, interact when they're added to the soil system as opposed to greenhouse studies? Um, and then, you know, there's limited regulation and testing of these products once they're released. And so there's a lot of product quality and consistency concern. So over time, I think that, um, you know, this will be improved. On the left hand side here, uh, I, I recently visited a, a farmer in, in Oregon here down, down the road from me where he was playing around with a couple of these seed coating products. And I'll zoom in here. Um, and the one on the right is the seed coat that they um, had used and they just planted them in these simple uh, clear tubes, um, which I thought was super clever and then put them in PVC uh, to hold them uh, structurally over time. And you can see on the, uh, the sample on the right, you know, has much higher root density than the sample on the left where this product wasn't um, applied. And then this is the zoomed in version at, at depth. So all the way down, uh, these tubes are probably about mm, close to six feet long. Um, so these grassroots are, are, are extending all the way down the system. So there's some merit there and I'm um, looking forward to working with this farmer and, and doing some demonstration trials and, and working in collaboration with our soil microbiologists on site to, to start to explore these different products. What are they? How do they behave in the field to, to help uh, build that body of knowledge? Um, and then I wanted to just uh, give an example of soil microbes for plant protection. This is one of those genes, the enzymes that I talked about, that is an indicator of a, a stress response in soils. And so this gene, it's called ACDS, it helps plants deal with drought. Um, and so in California, that's a pretty important uh, thing. Um, and so other studies by ARS scientists have shown that when this particular enzyme increases in soils, um, and again, this is released by soil microbes, the root biomass increased. And this was especially true when plants were exposed to drought. So this is one molecular marker that we're looking at to see if it can be used as an indicator of the ability of these systems to uh, fight against uh, different environmental stressors. So that one has uh, some nice promise. And then, um, I'm not going to go over this, but I, I, I will just provide it here for reference that there are a lot of different molecular um, indicators that addresses each of these different functions from carbon cycling, aggregation, of course, nutrient cycling, disease suppression, 
and stress resiliency. This is the cutting edge work that a lot of our ARS microbiologists are working on. Um, and so I really hope to be able to provide some more information uh, to the community over time um, as that research is, is conducted and updated. So what do we know? We know a lot. We know organisms release enzymes and drive nutrient transformations, specifically symbiotic associations like nitrogen fixing bacteria, um, right? And they form um, associations with plant roots and help plants acquire nitrogen directly from the atmosphere. Amazing process. We know those symbiotic associations between arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, right? Those hair, the root extensions help plants get access to more nutrients and more water. Um, we know that there are special fungi and bacteria that can help mine phosphorus that's bound to minerals and not made available for plants without their presence. Really important in um, soils that have both high and low pH. Um, we know that there are plant microbe communications. There's a whole communication system that's happening. Plants are talking with microbes to help um, um, uh, get the team on board to basically help a plant deal with a stress, either environmental or from a particular pathogen. We know that soil organisms, especially earthworms, fungi, and certain bacteria help stick soil particles together, aggregate them to help um, resist erosion. And we know that self, uh, soil organisms can be self-regulating because of the competition. If the system is healthy and balanced, the population check stays in balance as well and can help fight with diseases. So we wanna manage for biology. We wanna get the systems that have low diversity, that are highly disturbed, that don't have a lot of residues going into them. We wanna convert those to the systems on the right with cover crops, with integrating livestock where appropriate, with diversifying the systems, adding cover crops, diversifying the rotation, et cetera, to help build that biological community to help your system function at its optimal level. Um, so I, I said all this. And then I just wanna end, um, I did a quick search on the different labs across the country that provide these types of analysis. So um, Cornell and Oregon State Soil Health Labs both provide the, the um, assessments um, from the NRCS 216. Um, they specific, Cornell actually has one that's called NRCS 216. It costs about $140 a sample. Um, at Oregon State, they do almost exactly the same, but a little bit different with available water holding capacity and which nitrogen uh, tests they use for about uh, $134. They provide also these other assessments that uh, you know, at, a, at an additional cost um, to the person, but they are available. Some other tests I know, or labs I know of, University of Missouri, their SHAC, the Soil Health Assessment Center, offers a variety of um, assessments. Not exactly all the same um, as Cornell or, or Oregon State, um, uh, but they do offer them. I, I couldn't find their prices. Ward Labs is also a laboratory uh, that a lot of folks have used over the past. They have different soil health assessments at different costs uh, available. And then um, Brookside Laboratory is not quite as comprehensive of the soil health assessments um, as some of the other labs, but I know a lot of people have used those as well. This is not an exhaustive list. There are probably, you know, you know, many, many other soil labs across the country. These are just the ones that I happen to be more familiar with. Um, and then I was just going to emphasize that there's also field assessments. Uh, and so there's different things that you can look at qualitatively in the field that can give you some indications, you know, looking at cover, how quickly residue breaks down, whether you have surface crusting, compaction, ponding, et cetera. And these are all, again, related back to that biological uh, community and, and how it's functioning. Others looking at how the roots and pores look, aggregate stability field tests. You can look for activity in the field. Um, that's a little bit harder, but it is possible. Um, and even soil color can give you an indication of organic matter. So these are some things I just wanted to highlight that you don't always have to use laboratory high-tech uh, uh, um, assessments, but some field can get you there as well. 
So with that, thank you for your attention. I, hope, I think we have lots of time left. I know I spoke a little bit longer than intended, but I get excited about things and uh, it's hard to, hard to get me to stop. But um, my email and office phone number are listed. And if I don't answer your question adequately or uh, you would like some follow up with me, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That, I just learned a lot. That was a really great presentation. Um, so I'd like to let the audience all know that we are, we're booked till 1230. That's the end of the formal presentation and we're going to move into a question and answers, answer session facilitated by um, Dr. Karen Lowell, again with the, um, an agronomist from the Salinas Valley and a certified crop advisor herself that's helped uh, to put together this CFDN soil series of meetings. So with this, um, Karen, I think I'd like to turn it over to you. And um, I'm not sure, should we have uh, Jennifer stop sharing her screen or should we keep it up in order to jump around to slides? Let's leave it up in case she wants to return to one. Um, I think that might be helpful. Can you all hear me? Sounds good. Take it from here, Karen. Thanks. You can hear me, Sarah? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, um, I do have a dog in the background that might get excited about soil health as well. Um, Jen, there were a lot of questions um, and a few that I would characterize as clarifying questions. So let's hit those first. Um, one I can handle actually, uh, you did a comparison um, of indicators in a, a area that had been converted from CRP to cropland and folks needed to understand that that's um, I assume you were referring to Conservation Reserve Program. Thank you, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have a long discussion on that. We could have another one um, offline, but the short version is that's typically land that has been set into a highly um, resource conserving management approach. And so converting it to cropland would be converting it in such a way that those four principles that Jen showed with regard to thinking about soil health management would then become more intensive. So you would be expect to see some some changes. So I hope that's helpful. And I'm sorry I didn't um, jump in and offer that sooner. Some folks were frustrated. Um, okay, there was a question. Let's clarify this. Um, some folks have heard that the microbial biomass is a much higher percentage of the soil organic matter, up to 50%, including living and dead. Do you want to address that? please. Um, I would love to see that those reports. I, I'm not familiar with that study. So when I talk about microbial biomass, it's the carbon component of the microbial biomass as a fraction of the total carbon in a soil. So um, that's what I'm referring to. Maybe they're looking at um, a different fraction of organic matter or organic carbon. Sometimes it's related to um, a smaller pool like water extractable carbon, and that might be where the discrepancy is. But um, it, I would um, be very surprised if half of our organic carbon was was a, a microbial in nature. With the caveat being that dead microbial biomass, dead microbial cells, sometimes called necromass, necro, you know, necrosis, right for dead. Um, that is, uh, you know, now understood to be a really key component of organic matter in soils, organic carbon, and so perhaps that's what they're uh, thinking of. But as a strict, if you measure microbial biomass carbon and you measure total carbon in soils, it's typically, you know, somewhere in, in agronomic soils, it's usually about two to three percent. Some grassland soils can get up to five percent. Forested systems might even be a little bit higher, but uh, we're not talking about those today, but that's that's my understanding, and so it might be what we're what our denominator is. Uh, that is uh, the discrepancy, is my guess. Okay, all right, and I'm going to prompt you that we've got a bunch of questions, so I'll I'll try to keep you moving. Um, so that another maybe just a quick reply, and it may need to be followed up with getting them Kate's results. But there was a question on the confidence intervals around the data you were presenting, showing differences between cropped and uh, cover cropped and not cover cropped um, on a bunch of indicators. So if that's just a follow up and you can provide that, that might be the best way to handle that one. Yeah, it was just really for an example, uh, that data set was a, 
a, a data set of about 600 samples across the country. We, we were not uh, intending to isolate specific studies. So I could get those information. We could do the stats. So it was just to try to provide a, a California context. So I, I have them, but I don't, yeah, we could get them. Okay, all right. So um, maybe if Sarah or Mariana are taking notes, we can um, capture that. Um, I am going to jump now to there were so there were categories, right? I tried to organize these. One of one I grouped them characterizing the community, um, thinking about the activity measures and measuring function. And then there were questions that were specific, like um, somebody wanted to know if you can do all these tests in your USDA lab. Is that a yes, no? I, I can do them. I've done everything um, on that list except for ACE protein but we can do it, it's an easy one. Mm -hmm. So those are in research labs and I have gotten lots of questions in our work about where people can send them here in California. And I can tell you our search from the commercial labs that our customers um, routinely use, they're still somewhat limited. So um, as producers want them, I imagine they will become more available. Um, but I, that I do have a comment about that, Karen, if I may. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it'd be great if there was each state had one kind of similar to fertility right, right now. Well, one of the key differences, though, is that um, the majority of the soil health tests, excluding the, the chemical, the typical chemical analysis, aren't, um, they don't need modification from region to region. What's necessary is what the interpretation of those values are. That's where we need regional specific. But the actual methods um, are pretty uniformly uh, applicable and, and don't need modification from site to site. So, um, but that interpretation is really key and, and necessary. Right. So calibrating it for local conditions. But unfortunately, that's really important for the local labs to be willing to take that on and, and get that. Um, and I know there are research scientists working on it here locally. But at this time, if you're looking for a lab to send that to, I'd advise you to call them and ask them if you offer a specific test. Um, and as Jen indicated, make sure you send the sample in the condition it should be sent for the test to be done with the right assumptions about how it's been handled. Um, in the characterize the community, this is there were a few different questions and I'll give them to you all and then maybe you can just address them all. Um, somebody wanted your thoughts on trace genomics out of Ames, Iowa, if you're familiar with it. Um, another on biomakers and thinking about DNA soil samples. So just can you address that? I think they all are kind of grouped, really. They're looking at characterizing the community that's in a particular soil by looking at, um, you know, tra uh, um, DNA or biomarkers of some sort. I think the DNA molecular assessments have um, amazing potential to be indicators of a lot of these different functions, as I mentioned. Uh, I am not familiar with the commercial labs. I've heard of them, but uh, since we, you know, work directly with the soil microbiologists at, at ARS, we don't uh, utilize those those laboratories. Um, but as a team, the federal government is um, trying to establish that database so that we can provide uh, oversight and, and interpretations on that. So. How about, um, somebody wanted to know about thinking about measuring um, macro, meso, micro aggregates. Um, that's more back into the physical component. Um, and, and then thinking about that from the perspective of what do we know about connecting that to soil functions? And we have more questions, so don't go too long. I'm trying to decide how to answer that quickly. Uh, I, I, I like it. I do it in my lab. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of hours and time. It's it's high labor, um, but I think it, it's possible. That's my quick answer. Okay. Um, I am trying to keep up. Maybe Sarah, could you grab the questions that are continuing to come in in the chat and put them over in the Word doc for me? That'll help okay. me. Thank you. So I'm just going to keep moving through. There was also a question with regard to the aggregate stability. Is there an adjustment when you're looking at different textures of soils? So the question was specifically in a heavy clay soil. Um, but thinking broadly, uh, a heavy soil, a light textured soil, um, how, how do they capture that um, aggregate stability may be inherently different among textures?
We can't hear you, Jen. Jennifer, we lost you. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, this is from Cornell. They're, they're scoring it. it uh, aggregate stability is influenced um, by texture. Um, and so they kind of break soils out into coarse, medium, and fine and have different scoring curves because of that. Um, and so it, it is important to adjust for texture for some of these tests. Aggregate stability, organic carbon, organic matter are two of the big ones that, that need that adjustment um, minimally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. A lot of the other questions, and I have to, Sarah's helping me capture the ones that continue to come in, but some of the other questions are sort of what I think of as bridging that gap from you can measure something, you can describe something, and now you want to think about how is that useful in guiding management or assessing function in your soil. So one of the questions is, so as your soil organic matter increases from the use of cover crops or addition of carbon um, soil amendments, um, how much can you think, can you talk a little bit about how um, the carbon shifts that you might see in your system are likely related to um, shifts in microbial biomass versus the amendment versus the carbon, ex uh, the, the exudates from the roots as they're growing? Um, and I would add to that question, does it matter? Or are we just thinking, should we think about, is there carbon there to continue to fuel the microbial um, activity? So I'll give you a moment to ponder. I could play music, but. The, the short answer is it depends on what you're trying to answer, right? So like you just said, Karen, if, if we're just interested in, in, in carbon total and, and as a fuel and, and energy source for, for microbes, uh, we can look at some of the labile pools. If, if we're looking at for like carbon credits and that kind of thing as we're embarking on climate mitigation pathways, then we have a different set of procedures and protocols. So um, they're all important and, and, and the flow of carbon from one pool to another is probably more important um, for driving biological uh, functions than, you know, say the old carbon that is important for uh, you know, climate mitigation, carbon sequestration, and building, you know, these other physical attributes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so another question now sort of on thinking about your sampling. Somebody wanted to think about when is it best to sample? Um, somebody wanted to know thinking about how would you delineate sampling units? So the question was, if we're trying to measure soil health and carbon on a very large grassland particle, okay, um, should we organize our soil testing by the property's major soil types? Or, I'm gonna to add to it, or would you look at what's growing and how it's growing, or topography? Um, there's, of course, lots of things you might think about. Um, obviously, past management is relevant. So, um, seasonality, and it may or may not also, what just happened, right? Like you gave an example of transitioning. I'm talking for a minute to let you think. Transitioning from land that has been managed one way, now you're managing in a new way. So after you transition management, when do you think about starting to look for shifts in different kinds of indicators you might be tracking? Season is a really big deal. And so historically, we tended to sample um, in track with where fertility measurements are made, and that's usually at spring or fall, um, you know, post or pre, you know, pre-plant or post-harvest, right? Um, that makes a lot of logistical sense. Um, my personal opinion um, for soil health, because these are biologically driven systems, um, I would argue that if I had my choice, I would do it in the middle of the growing season when it was, uh, at a real high level because you want to compare that active growing influence of the plant on the system. Um, and, and some of these are, are that dynamic. Now, one could argue that they should still be maintained over time, right? And so, uh, you know, characterizing uh, at, a, at a, a fall or spring is also fine. Um, you know, we still recommend to follow that pre-plant or post-harvest just to be in sync with also the fertility. Um, and, um, but, but, you know, you get, you get three, uh, soil scientists in a room, we're going to give you three different answers. Um, uh, so probably the most important, uh, 
advice is to be consistent. And so if you're tracking over time and you did pre-plant, then you need to go back at pre-plant um, in following years. You don't wanna do pre-plant one year and post-harvest another and in the middle of the season in another year. Consistency is your friend for comparisons. Um, grasslands, yeah, they're really uh, diverse and you can get a lot of variability in a small amount of space. I would say, um, you know, at a minimum, chunk it out by different soil types. Topography is going to be a big deal in grasslands. We don't have like the simple flat fields in, in some of our agronomic systems, uh, although ag systems also can be on slopes, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, basically try to, um, at a minimum, on big different topography or soil mapping units, uh, you know, get the soil web survey out and, and use that. That's your friend. Uh, embark on a, a local soil scientist, NRCS, so a lot of conservation district staff to help guide you. And then it really comes down to money. Do as many as you can afford. Uh, and that's that's how we're driven by our research. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes they're not enough. They're not enough. Oh, I can't hear you all of a sudden, Karen. I muted myself in case the dog barks. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'll put on my practitioner's hat for a moment and just add on to what you just said that it also depends on why you're measuring it. Thank if you. you're measuring um, to guide your nutrient management, then you would be sampling at the time you would sample your soil anyway for your crop's performance, you know, uh, yield and quality. If you're measuring it to document carbon gains for carbon um, trade markets, that's a different purpose, right? Um, and I would also think about what's in terms of sampling unit. What's a practical management unit? I often get questions about that in cropland. I'm like, well, what, how do you manage differently? If you're going to manage it all as one, regardless, then there are some, uh, you know, in terms of if you're guiding nutrient management or irrigation water management. So I think there's lots of sort of framework questions that are important to build out in your mind, and then worry about the minutia of the sampling because um, there's some practical considerations that are important. Um, and just I'll just add that one way to kind of um, balance cost versus you know uh, need, and that is taking a lot of samples and pooling them all together, right? The more you can do that to represent your area, as long as you're taking the same amount from these different units. Again, if you, it is all under one management, that's one way to save on cost, but still try to represent um, the entire field. So that that's one way we we try to do it. So take 10, 20 cores mix it up and, and submit that single sample. Okay. Okay, um, so here's another question um, that has to do with thinking about uh, looking at soil management with an eye towards uh, managing plant, plant disease and pest management. So the question is, if we want to improve microbial health in the soil and create a balance that helps with plant disease resistance, what are the best ways to help create an environment conducive to microbial health? Are there things that should be avoided or minimized? This is a whole nother topic, but if you want to throw out some sort of big picture thinking, that might be helpful um, for the questioner. So are they, um, can you tell from the question, are, are they interested in trying to identify indicators of like a resilient system or are they trying to look for um, indicators that there's a problem, you know, like that there's different ways to kind of slice that up. Um, but I, I'll just kind of say that one of the big research pushes is to develop the, the systems to best be able to answer that question, right? Like, so we, you need to have the path, pathogen pressure, you need to have the environmental stressor. And, in, you know, that you can do that in the greenhouse, but then it all kind of falls apart when you go to the field, right? Um, so long-term experiments are really important, you know, helping to support those and, uh, and, and that kind of thing to, to be able, again, to build the database up so that you can make those inferences would be my short answer to that. I think the question comes from somebody I know, and I, I'm guessing she's thinking big picture. So things like, um, is there a management that will encourage abundance of a particular um, microbial fauna or flora that would then be of either a detriment or a benefit for 
um, suppressing or encouraging beneficial organisms. So it's sort of, there's sort of lots of steps in there that um, we'd have to think through. And that's why I don't want to take us in a whole nother webinar because we do have other questions, but just to, um, I think that's what, um, and if that questioner wants to pop in the message and confirm or tell me, no, I've totally missed it, that's fine. Yeah, um, yeah, the, the, we know that when we change our plant communities, when we change even varieties, we change our microbial community. Um, and so a, a lot of the research is trying to design systems that help to support different um, assemblages of beneficials, for example, to help uh, combat, you know, uh, uh, disease pressure or, you know, drought uh, on those kinds of things. So by selecting plants that are known to inspire, if you will, a particular uh, group of, of bacteria or fungi is something that people are working on right now. It's a really hot and emerging field. Um, and then, you know, to be able to design cover crop species, right, to help push, you know, different groups that can help, you know, address specific needs. Um, it's in its infancy, but it's really promising, and I think they'll get there. But um, but we don't have the recipes yet, for sure. Uh, some 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 you know instances, but uh, it's pretty limited. Okay. Um, there was a question specifically, and I want to make sure we hit it because I think lots of people have them. Like, what about my cropping system? So there's a question, and I haven't heard much about it um, in rice systems. Obviously, soil management. And rice cropping systems is different than in, you know, I was going to call it dry land. It's not dry land, but not flooded systems. Can you talk briefly about what um, what you know about uh, understanding soil health dynamics in those systems? I know nothing about rice. Sorry. So we won't. I know nothing. Uh, yeah, I, I I can't even. I could guess, but I, I'm not the right person to answer that question for sure. Yeah. I will follow up with the questioner and see if we can't connect um, them to some other resources. But thank you for the honesty. It's the best part of being a good professional. So, um, so another question. Um, uh, I'm not sure I understand it as it's written. So, if one's focus is recalcitrant soil carbon removal. Mm -hmm. One might try to increase soil organic carbon, but it's unclear how to distinguish recalcitrant, for example, glycoproteins versus dynamic fractions, bacteria, fungi, et cetera. Any suggestions? I wonder if that's along the lines of, um, I, I used to give it to my uh, PhD students for their prelims, like, do we want to hoard or do we want to use carbon, right? So. Again, it's that flow, you need both. It's like a bank account where you have like your long-term savings like secured away and like something, you know, solid. And then you've got some money where you're playing around with, you know, to, to get that flow of, of, you know, equity, liquid equity kind of thing. So you, you need the fresh inputs that helps drive the biology. And then you need the stability of a system that helps build the recalcitrant um, carbon that that is important for, these longer term uh, functions. So you, you need both. You, you, you don't want to just emphasize one over the other, but you, you need to consider the management system that provides um, carbon inputs into the system and that help them to protect those kind of the, you know, overarching principles. Maybe that's hopefully in line. We'll have to let the questioner get to us, but I, I, I wonder too if for the broader group, the thinking about the importance of this seems to be parsing it more finely than what I think of as active carbon that is readily accessible for microbial metabolism versus recalcitrant that may remain um, unoxidized for long periods of time. And those, like, as you start to parse down those, I guess one of the things that all of the folks who are interested in this have to think about is why do I need to know that? Like if you need to know it because you're trying to understand how to think about your nutrient cycling, you might want a certain measure. If you want it again for understanding how well you're documenting that you're increasing your carbon stores, that's a different question. So um, the, the, you really need 
specific information about why you want to make that measurement, and that, um, and I'm happy to follow up. I'll put my email eventually too. It's an interesting question, and I wanted to make sure we asked it. Although, um, I, I kind of, it's one of those things where you kind of want to do. Well, tell us exactly what you're asking because I'm not sure I got it. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, there was a question about where to purchase a rainfall simulator. Do you know if there, uh, NRCS has one, um, not like the one you're showing in your lab setup, but are they commercially available? Um, I think you can buy that thing from Cornell if you want. They they do have a field version of it. I, I, I can't remember how much it costs. It was pretty, it's like $1,000 or more for a field version and that thing, I, I have no idea how much it costs. Um, you know, if you're if you're doing it qualitatively, there's some like rapid, you know, infield assessments that you can look at just to kind of get an idea. Um, you know, uh, in the lab, we've got a machine that oscillates uh, little sieves of soil up and down at a given uh, speed and, and cadence, and you could recreate that. We we we've done it by hand in the in the. So there are ways to do it, but. Uh, uh, you know, again, it, I would again ask, what do you want to get from that? Uh, and, and is it for research purposes or is it just curiosity? And then we could help design a, a, a appropriate protocol. Well, but, and there are aggregate stability tests that can be done with sieves in the field that are, um, they're not going to give you perhaps the well-controlled peer-reviewed data-ready publication. But if you're looking to compare one site to another, um, or changes over time at a same site, understanding what your benchmark is, is probably the most important thing, I, I would think. Um, I, I heard that there's even a phone app now for aggregate stability. I haven't tried it, but uh, I've, I've heard positive reviews about it. So that's awesome. I have, and I recommend you have a stand for your phone. <laughs> Holding it steady is a we Consistency had. is the key, right, to the height. Uh, and it may or may not be, um, it may or may not give you data depending on what you're trying to sample. The instance in which we tried it, um, the soil was so compacted that it didn't fall apart, but it was not aggregate stability as we're discussing it here. It was cemented. Um, uh -huh. yeah. So this next one is sort of a, um, um, it's moving from, okay, we can measure things, we can think about what that tells us about, um, you know, what's happening in terms of um, activity of the microbial activity, what are they doing, how well are they functioning, but now this question is, let's move that to management considerations. So the question is, can the knowledge of soil science, soil properties be used to reduce gully water erosion in a low rainfall area without using engineering solutions. So can we think a little bit now, we're thinking about, so the example I always think of is if you have good infiltration, you're gonna put water down, you're not gonna get concentrated flow, so you're going to have a soil surface that is more resilient in a rainfall than a soil that's um, highly compacted and so the water doesn't infiltrate, it starts to concentrate and then it starts to cut. So this individual is thinking about that, like how, how would, what other things might we think about where you can think about measuring various soil health indicators and how does that move to management? Well, in that kind of example, it's almost like a tree. Like if, if you're seeing erosion, you, you got it and then you can, you can address it. Um, if you're trying to design a system that can help reduce that and you want to know whether you're effective at it or not, um, um, you know, the, the, those more physical attributes, right, the, 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 a true aggregate laboratory aggregate stability test, um, you know, infiltration tests uh, can be done. They're pretty highly variable as well. So, sorry, Karen, is the person asking more about management strategies or, or indicators to, to, to monitor over time? I, I'm sorry, I kind of lost uh, the, the question. Well, I may, be, I may be wrong, but I think, the, I think the question is basically, what are we supposed to do with all this, Like, right? And I think the earlier discussion of thinking about, is there a way to evaluate a soil and 
um, design management to optimize a particular thing we can measure for, a particular bacterial fungal ratio, that's one I hear all the time, right, to optimize the soil as a healthy environment for plants so you don't end up with abundance of a particular soil-borne disease organism. So they're just looking for thoughts on, so we can measure all kinds of things, what are we going to do with it? How do we yeah. use that? apply it to practical conservation challenges? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is the answer they're looking for, but one of the conversations we're having with ARS and the, you know, scientists have been measuring these things for decades, right, across the country and, and how, to, how, to, how to almost make a matrix of if your concern is X, then you should be focusing on these three things. If it's Y, you know, you might need these other two or four things. Um, and so to help guide, you know, right now, again, we're still in the acquisition phase of trying to understand even what, what's there, how does management affect these things, what are our thresholds, so that we can better, more specifically, answer that question. So we're, we're sort of, you know, data poor in some areas and not, you know, a lot of data, but the wrong kind in other areas. And so really having a concerted standardized, you know, campaign to be able to make sense of the noise is, is what um, a lot of the ARS and scientists, that soil biology group I mentioned is, is working on with these databases. So, um, you know, we're kind of where fertility recommendations were, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, right? We're, we're, we're acquiring, again, the good news is, is we're going to get to those recommendations a lot faster just because of simple technological advancement. So we're not there, you know, yet per se to be prescriptive like that. Um, but, you know, you, you want to just work, you know, you can, it's kind of like also a, a fertility test or pH, right? You know, it, it's one of those indicators that can tell you you've got a major problem. There, there's certain tests that can kind of give you that indication um, or not. It, it You just kind of want to look work with like a local expert and and design a, a protocol that makes sense for, for your system and your questions in hand. So I know that's a little bit of a cop out, but it, it really is true um, to adequately answer it. Yeah, I, thank you. And I think, I mean, that is ultimately the goal, right? Like we don't want information just for kicks and giggles. We want to know what what we need to know in order to guide a decision. Um, and that's definitely a process. So, um, and I, I encourage those folks on the call who are managing ground to approach it from what, what am, what am I, what do I need to know and why? Um, and some of the questions that there are tests to measure for may not give you what you need to know, and they might be expensive. So I encourage you to think from a practical standpoint, what do I need to know, why, um, and, and then you guide by your own management needs. And Jen, I think we are at the end of our time. There are still some questions, and I hope that people will take you up on your offer to reach out to you directly. Um, maybe you could put that slide up again for just a second. Um, or put it in the chat, that might be better because Sarah's gonna put up the QAR car um, indicator for the folks on the call who are CCAs and can get continuing education credits for this. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, would you mind stop sharing right now? And I'm gonna put that QR code in, up in just a moment. Um, so we are coming to the end of the meeting. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and a really engaging discussion. Thank you to the farmers, the ranchers, the technical assistance providers, and the, those curious about soils who asked some really good questions today in the chat. Karen, Karen you did a wonderful job managing and facilitating that conversation. Thank you so much. Um, and as a reminder to those who are watching this, um, this, this meeting series, this is the fourth um, in a series of four meetings of the California Farm Demonstration Network. These recordings are gonna live for now on the carcd.org website. You can find this through the current projects um, 
let's see, there's like a drop down tab to current projects to the California Farm Demonstration Network. And later this year, we're going to be transitioning all this content to a standalone website for the California Farm Demonstration Network. So stay tuned. We'll reach out to all of you who registered to see if you're interested in um, keeping up to date with that. So I think um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and go and share my screen. Thanks so much, everybody.